All right, did you feel like you made progress on this? Smiles? Oh, I can't see your smiles. What am I thinking? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Indifferent, sort of sideways, okay. Um, yeah, these these are trickier than they you would think they would be at first. Perhaps, especially the first one. <clears throat> Prove that negative one times A is negative A. In other words, think about what this really means. The additive inverse of the unity, this is an arbitrary ring. This is not necessarily the number one. It could be the identity matrix, for example, if it's a matrix ring. The additive inverse of the identity, the unity, I should say, excuse me, times an arbitrary element of the ring is the additive inverse of that arbitrary element. That's how you should think of this. The additive inverse of the unity, one, times an arbitrary element is the additive inverse of the given element. Hmm. It's not clear how to go about doing this. You gotta experiment sometimes. You just have to try some things. And it turns out one of the best things to try here is to say, well, what would happen if I add A and negative one times A? What should I get if this is gonna be true? What should you get? If this is indeed true? Zero, you should get zero here. So the question is, do you? I should have stated at the beginning that, um, well, it's implicit that the unity exists here. R is a ring with unity. How do you show this equals zero? Can you just say it equals zero? No, you've got to use the definition of a ring. You only are allowed to use the properties in the definition of a ring. In this case, a ring with unity. And one property of a ring with unity is that any element a, like A there is the unity times itself. A does equal one times A. We have to give a reason. It's the definition of the unity. I do say the unity because we do have a theorem that says unities are unique when they exist. What do you think I should do next? Did you try what I'm doing right right here? Anybody? No. What do you think I should do next? Inverse a. Use this, you mean? Like maybe add it to both sides or something? Yeah, get rid of that. That's something you could certainly try. Uh, it's quicker to use one of the properties than in the definition of a ring. Go back to the definition. What is this sort of set up to be able to use? Distributive property. Factor out the A, so to speak. That's the distributive property. Now, technically, there's a right distributive property and a left distributive property. So I'm okay with it if you just say distributive property. They're both assumed to be true in the definition of a ring. This is a left distributive property where A just where A is on the left and distributes over the sum. This is the right distributive property where A is on the right and distributes over the sum. Technically speaking, by doing the factoring as we did, we're using the right distributive property with D equal to one and C equal to negative one. Though again, those are not necessarily the numbers one and negative one, they could be matrices, for example. The identity matrix and its additive inverse. But that's the distributive property. Can I say one plus negative one does equal zero? Uh huh. It does. By definition of additive identity, R is a group under addition. We know one plus the additive identity, additive inverse of one is 
the additive identity, definition of additive inverses. Could just say R is a group under addition. Wait a minute, can we say zero times A equals zero? I claim you can, but technically speaking, we need another property to do that, that we would be assuming has been proved here. And that is a theorem in chapter 12. A times zero equals zero times A equals zero is a theorem, not, a, not part of the definition. It, it does require proof. The author actually does prove that one. Think of this as the additive identity zero, which could be the zero matrix if we're talking about a matrix ring, or the zero polynomial if we're talking about a polynomial ring, times an arbitrary element of the ring, could be an arbitrary matrix or an arbitrary polynomial, equals that additive identity. You need to prove this, or the book needs to prove it because it's not assumed in the definition. But that's what we use here. This, so this is theorem 12.1, part one. And does that do it? Does that prove what we wanted to prove? That the negative one A equals the opposite of A? In other words, the additive inverse of one times an arbitrary element is the additive inverse of that element? It does because of the uniqueness of additive inverses. We already know inverses in group theory are unique. This implies that negative 1a is the additive inverse of a. And since a is arbitrary, that's going to be true for all a and all. Property two. Suppose we've got a couple other elements. And yeah, I forgot that assumption. Initially, we need to assume r is commutative. Prove that B divides C if and only if A times B divides C. Let's try this direction. Assume B divides C. Show that A, divide, A times B divides C, where A again is a unit, meaning it's got a multiplicative inverse. A inverse has a under multiplication exists. Well, what does B dividing C mean? It means looking in the definition of divides, which you know we know for integers way back in chapter zero, but now we're generalizing the idea of divisibility to rings. B divides C means there exists a, a D in R such that C equals B times D. That's what divisibility means. We are talking about this in the context of commutative ring. Because you might wonder, well, does the D need to be on the right or does it need to be on the left? We are assuming R is commutative here. So I could also write that as D times B. We, again, what do we want to show? We want to show that A times B divides C, where A again is a unit. It's got an inverse. This ring implicitly has a unity, a one. Any bright ideas? Did you have anything? Here's a little hint. If C equals B times D and there's a unity, it also equals one times B times D. How am I gonna bring the A into play? And possibly it's inverse, it's multiplicative inverse because it's a unit. one of these things where it's like, well, it's like the only thing you can do. And does it work? 
What can I replace one with? Or I know I've got this A that's assumed to be a unit. I want to somehow bring this into the equation. A inverse exists, what does that mean? What's A times A inverse? Go ahead and say it. One. one. Yeah, one can be replaced by A times A inverse. And that means C ultimately can be written as A times, in parentheses, A inverse BD. And the ring is commutative. I could have had the A on the other side. This does mean A, a times, oh, well, excuse me, I should rewrite it again. The ring is commutative. I can rewrite this as AB times A inverse D. R is commutative. Now I've got C is A times B times something in the ring. Therefore, A times B does divide C. It's, it's one of the situ situations where once you see it, it's pretty clear, but when you're trying to figure it out in the first place, it's definitely can't, can be tricky and not so clear. Don't be afraid to, again, do some scratch work, experiment, try some things, see if it works out. What about the other direction? Assume A times B divides C, where again, A is a unit. And we want to show B divides C. This is an if and only if. Well, what does that mean? It means there, we can again say there exists a D in the ring such that C equals AB times D. The ring is commutative. I can also write that as D times AB. Though commutivity doesn't need to be mentioned there. We're only talking about divisibility in a, a commutative ring here. Can you talk about divisibility in non-commutative rings? Yeah, but then you have to emphasize left divisibility versus right divisibility, so to speak. So to keep things simple, when we talk about divisibility, we're talking about commutative rings. What's the goal again? The goal is to show B divides C. Uh, there's not much to do here, is there? Basically, we're done. That's the same as saying C is B times, in parentheses, AD, or if you prefer, AD times B. Therefore, B divides C. So that direction is easy and really doesn't require the assumption that A is a unit. We never use the fact that A is a unit there. Okay. Any questions about that? Got to work with it. Okay. Get used to things. Um, I'd like to start looking at some things in chapter 13 here. And I think what might be that most beneficial is to start thinking about the examples on the second page in chapter 13 together. Paul Hamos was a famous mathematician. I do, I do hope you read these quotes. I think they're great quotes. Paul Hamos, famous mathematician in the 20th century. Don't just read it. Ask your own questions. Look for your own examples. Discover your own proofs. Is the hypothesis necessary? Is the converse true? What happens in the classical special case? Where does the proof use the hypothesis? Be an active reader. And that includes, as you're just reading through examples, make sure you check things. Maybe you don't have time to check everything, but 
check as much as you've got time for or try to make more time. What are we talking about here with these examples? A new concept called an integral domain. Well, what is the definition of an integral domain? An integral domain is a commutative ring with unity and no zero divisors. Hmm, what's a zero divisor? A zero divisor is a non-zero element, A, in a commutative ring, so that there's some another, other non-zero element, B, where the product of A and B is zero. So somehow, in a sense, even though A and B are non-zero, they are dividing zero? Yeah, kind of. It should seem bad if a ring has zero dividers, just as an initial gut reaction to this. Like, why would you want there to be non-zero elements whose product is zero? Wouldn't that be kind of bad? Well, bad is maybe not the best word to use. Unpleasant or unfortunate, those might be better words, but zero divisors do happen in rings. I mentioned this example last week, but let's just do the computation. In M2, we talked about M2R last week. Let's do M2Z this week. What is that? That's the ring of two by two matrices with integer entries now instead of real number entries. This is a ring as well under the operations of matrix addition and matrix multiplication, the ordinary matrix addition and ordinary matrix multiplication are the operations here. I claim that this matrix 0, 1, 0, 0, which is not the zero matrix, is a zero divisor. that thing. It is important that it not be the zero matrix because that's part of the definition of zero divisor. We're talking about non-zero elements. That's not the zero matrix. It's got a one in that spot right there. How would I prove it's a zero divisor? Well, I'd have to find some other matrix or maybe even it itself to multiply by to get zero, some other non-zero matrix. Yeah, if you multiply it by itself, if you square this matrix, multiply it by itself, check with me here, you do get the zero matrix. Do ordinary matrix multiplication. For the upper left entry, do the dot product, so to speak, of the first row and the first column. Zero times zero plus one times zero, I'll go ahead and write it out. Zero times zero plus one times zero is zero. For the upper right entry, zero times one plus one times zero, that'll be zero as well. And yeah, for the lower left and lower right entries, you're doing zero times zero plus zero times zero, and then also zero times one plus zero times zero. We do get the zero matrix, the additive identity in M2Z. I could have written M2R, I could have written M2Q for Q for quotients or rational numbers. That's a zero divisor. Yeah, zero divisors when they exist are, they kind of mess things up, so to speak. And so you might say they're unfortunate, but they do occur. We need to realize that they occur in some rings. An integral domain then is a commutative ring with unity and no zero dividers, no non zero elements, non zero element pairs, you might say, A and B, whose product is zero. By the way, when you look at this, if A is a zero divisor, then B is a zero divisor as well, because it's also non zero. It's another example of a zero divisor. This is not an integral domain. Therefore, M2Z 
is not an integral domain. It's kind of a strange name, integral domain. Does it have to do with integrals from calculus? Uh, no, it doesn't. The word integral here kind of more refers to integers. Integral domains are a natural generalization or abstraction of the integers because in the integer z, there are no zero divisors. Z is a commutative ring with unity and no zero divisors. So Z is your, you might say, one of your simplest kinds of integral domains. How about, I could also, I could ask, is, say, Z4 an integral domain? Pretty quickly, if you check, for non-zero products and see if they equal zero or not, you'll see the answer is no. For example, EG means for example, two squared is four is zero mod four, but two is not zero mod four. Is Z six an integral domain? I'll abbreviate integral domain ID. No, for example, two times three is six is zero mod six, but two is not zero mod six, and three is non zero mod six. Uh, is Z3 an integral domain? You look for zero watt divisors, you won't find any. Let's make a quick multiplication table. We don't, when, when we make the, the multiplication table for a ring like this, we don't really need to make the, the row and column for zero because zero, the additive identity times anything like we just mentioned 10 minutes ago, in the theorem, zero times a equals zero for any a. So we don't really need to make part of the multiplication to the multiplication table to include zero. For the multiplication table here, we really only need to think about one and two. And we're multiplying these mod three, right? Well, one is the multiplicative identity. So you quickly compute those things. What's two times two? Two times two is four, mod three is one. We didn't get zero anywhere. Z3 is an integral domain. The answer is yes, Z3 is an integral domain. Is. It is a commutative ring with unity. The unity is one and no zero divisors. Examples are not proofs, but in general, Zn is an integral domain if and only if n is prime. Again, examples are not proofs, but they certainly help you believe it. Okay, let's look at more at the books examples here. Some of which we haven't talked about yet. So the ring of integers is an integral domain. Yeah, Z is a commutative ring with unity and no zero divisors. Is 2Z an integral domain? Meaning 2Z is the even integers? It's commutative. It doesn't have any zero divisors, but doesn't have a unity. So it's got to have the be commutative with unity as well, according to our book's definition. So 
2z, the even integers, does not form an integral domain because it's missing a unity. The ring of Gaussian integers, zi, all complex numbers a plus bi, where a and b are integers. That turns out to be an integral domain. So we proved that. Well, I'm not going to do a formal proof, but let's see if we can do a calculation that helps us believe it. It is a, um, a ring, a commutative ring with unity. The unity is indeed the number one. One plus zero i is the unity. i is the imaginary unit. Its square is negative one. We're talking complex numbers here. But we're talking about the real and imaginary parts, the A and the B being integers instead of arbitrary real numbers. So this is not the entire complex plane. Could it possibly have any zero divisors? Is it possible to have two complex numbers here, A plus BI and C plus DI, that are non zero that multiply together to give you zero? Now, keep in mind that being non-zero means that, you know, this being non-zero means that either A is non-zero or B is non-zero or both. Same kind of thing here. How do you multiply complex numbers? Well, just essentially we treat them like two linear polynomials and FOIL. First times first is AC, outside times outside is ADI. Inside times inside is BCI, and last times last is BDI squared. But anytime you see an I squared, replace it with negative one. And then we can group together the two terms that do not involve I after that simplification, and the two terms that do involve I. We can write AC minus BD plus. A, D plus B, C, I. Is there any way this can be zero in the situation where either A or B is non-zero and also either C or D is non-zero? The answer is no, but it's maybe not so clear why not. Certainly, when you do many examples, you'll see that it won't be zero. Um, if you think, well, this is not a proof, but maybe it's a plausibility argument. If you think of, say, take A and B to be fixed and say both non zero, this is not a proof, but. What I'm about to, to show you is not a proof, but it might help you believe it. If you take A and B to say both be non zero, just for the sake of argument, and you set both of these things equal to zero, what happens? You might wonder. Suppose. A and B are non zero. And suppose AC minus BD equals zero and AD minus a plus BC equals zero. That's a system of linear equations in C and D that we could try to solve for C and D. That's equivalent to thinking of C and D as the unknown quantities here. Let me switch around the order of these things on the bottom. BC plus AD. Essentially is equivalent to a vector equation, a matrix vector equation, where your matrix is A negative B, BA, 
your vector, your unknown vector is CD and you've got the zero vector on the right hand side. The question is, are there any non-zero solutions to this? And the answer is no. And the reason is this matrix has a non-zero determinant. Its determinant is A squared minus um, negative B squared. A squared plus B squared, which will be positive. And actually, I, to say that's positive, I really don't need just to assume they're both non-zero. I need to just assume at least one of them is non-zero. And this will be positive. So if you've got a positive non-zero determinant, this is only going to have the trivial solution for C and D. That means C and D are both zero. So while this is not a full proof, it's you might call it a partial proof. If you assume the product is zero. In other words, if you assume both of these are zero, and if you assume either A is non-zero or B is non-zero, you are forced to conclude that C and D are both zero. It's pretty close to a proof action. I'm just not really filling in the argument enough to call it a proof. Remember that from linear algebra? If the matrix has a non-zero determinant, this homogeneous equation is only going to have the trivial solution. You could do row operations to confirm it as well. What's this? Zx. Hmm. That, those two notations are pretty similar to each other. But they do mean different things. Z with an I inside the square brackets refers to this set of complex numbers where the real and imaginary parts are integers. Zx, which is going to be a very important ring for us here, this is not a side light. This kind of ring is going to be very important for us. I remember I said last week that polynomial rings are really going to be our most important examples to think about. Rings where the elements are polynomials. And Zx is the set of all the ring of all polynomials with integer coefficients. If I had written Rx, it would be the set of all polynomials with real coefficients. And that's a ring as well. Qx would be the ring of polynomials with rational coefficients. The Z specifies the coefficients. The square brackets and the X in there emphasizes this is just standard notation for the ring of polynomials with those coefficients. The I here could be thought of as kind of like a, a unknown variable, so to speak, kind of like the X, but not quite. I mean, this is this is like a linear polynomial in I, but remember I squared is negative one by definition. X is an, is an indeterminate, so it's, it's a true variable. X squared does not equal negative one. It's a variable in the usual sense that you're used to. And the polynomials in here don't have to be just first degree, they can be higher degree. Not going to prove it, but you multiply two non-zero polynomials with integer coefficients, you're going to get a non-zero polynomial. That should make intuitive sense based on your experience from the past. This is a ring that's also an integral domain. Z square bracket square root of two, kind of analogous to this in terms of what it equals. No, those are not complex numbers. Those are all real numbers, but they're not all rational numbers. If B is non-zero, it's a non-rational number. It's an irrational number. This is a ring. How do you multiply things in, in this ring? It's, it's kind of similar to how we multiply complex numbers. We, with complex numbers, we use the fact that I squared is negative one. In this ring, you use the fact that, well, square root of two squared is two. The standard examples that we consider in group theory versus ring theory generally are different from each other. Even though all rings are groups under addition, there's a different emphasis in ring theory. There are finite rings. Zn is a finite ring. 
But it turns out we're not as interested in finite rings as we are in finite groups. So there's a special class of finite rings that'll have some importance for us. They're called finite fields. If you multiply two elements in this ring, denoted again by this standard notation, this is the standard notation for it, shorthand notation for this ring, this set of real numbers of this form will understand standard addition and multiplication of real numbers. How do you multiply? Once again, you FOIL. First times first is AC. Outside times outside is AD root two. Inside times inside is BC root two. And last times last is BD times two, right? Square root of two times square root of two. I could have written square root of two squared initially. Then group together the things that don't involve a square root of two after simplification and group together the things, things that do. Very analogous to what we did with the complex numbers. And the argument for you could give for this being an integral domain could be a similar argument to what I was hinting at up here. Suppose the product is zero, that'll give you, and if you suppose A and B are fixed, for example, and at least one of them is non-zero, you can set up a system of linear equations and show that C and B must be zero. ZP is an integral domain when P is prime. ZN is not an integral domain when N is not prime. Actually, a proof that ZP is an integral domain when P is prime is subsumed in this theorem that when P is prime, ZP forms a field. I did mention what a field was last week. We'll talk about it in a few minutes. M2Z is not an integral domain. We saw an example that it's got zero divisors. Zero, one, zero, zero, that matrix was a zero divisor. One example of a zero divisor, there are many more actually. There's infinitely many zero divisors. In ring theory, we don't call this the external direct product anymore. Did you notice that? We call it the external direct sum. Kind of confusing. The author doesn't give a comment as to why. And I've never looked up why either. You could. Why is this kind of thing called an external direct product in group theory and an external direct sum in ring theory? But the claim is that the external direct product of Z with itself as a ring is not an integral domain. It's got zero divisors, really? Even though Z doesn't have any? Yeah, and if you experiment a little bit, it's pretty quick to find a zero divisor. For example, one zero is a zero divisor. Why? Well, for example, if you multiply it by zero one, you get zero because you do component-wise multiplication. Now, remember, before this class, you never did component-wise multiplication with ordered pairs. So you might wonder, you know, is this a really a good thing to do? Because usually, like in you think about multivariable calculus or linear algebra with vectors like this, so to speak, you're doing a dot product instead of a component-wise multiplication. And we do emphasize dot product in those courses because for most applications, data products have more applications. This is a purely algebraic thing to multiply component by component wise. And it does make this thing a ring, but maybe it's not a very useful thing. And it is not an integral domain because again, here we have two non-zero <clears throat> ordered pairs that multiply to give you the, the zero, the additive identity. 
So even though it's a ring, it's not being an integral domain, it is kind of deficient. It, got to be careful with it, that kind of thing. All right, what is a field? A field, again, is a commutative ring with unity in which every non-zero element is a unit. Every non-zero element has a multiplicative inverse. Fields, you might take the perspective that they are the best rings. But that word best is a matter of taste. They certainly have all the properties that you might hope would be true. All the properties you'd want to use. What are some examples of fields? Is Z a field? All right. It's an integral domain. It doesn't have any zero divisors, but there's only two units, plus or minus one. What about Q, the rational numbers? Is that a field? Set of all fractions, A over B, such that A and B are integers, and we're not dividing by zero. Under standard addition and multiplication of fractions, is that a field? It is. You got a non zero fraction. That means the numerator must be non zero. It's got a multiplicative inverse, right? What would the multiplicative inverse be? You know this. B over A, yeah. Since we know how to multiply fractions. And since A is non-zero, so B over A exists. We're not dividing by zero. Everything cancels, you get one. We're assuming we know how to multiply fractions. We're assuming we know how to cancel things by writing this. You know that that's valid. Actually, to say Q is this set is actually a little bit misleading. We won't worry about it because it kind of shoves under the rugs, rug the fact that we got equivalent fractions. If you, when you just write Q as a set like this, it's kind of shoving under the rug the question of whether two thirds equals four sixths. We know, of course, that it does, but this notation doesn't explain why. Q is not literally in this, and because of that, it's not literally this set. Um, you have to define an equivalence relation on this set. Let's say A over B equals C over D, if and only if A, D minus B, C equals zero, or alternatively, if and only if A, D equals B, C. Or I'm assuming I'm not dividing by zero here as well. That turns out to be an equivalence relation on this set if I don't call that set Q. And then Q turns out to be the set of equivalence classes. When you reduce a fraction, when you do reduce four six to two thirds, you're really finding the simplest representative of the equivalence class. Remember equivalence classes are really sets, sets of things that are equivalent to each other. But, you know, we don't teach equivalence classes to fourth graders. It's what's really going on behind the scenes, but we just go ahead and say equals. 
even though they're technically different symbols, they do represent the same number. And we will, after this point, we're not going to be quite so formal. We'll just say Q is this set and not worry about it. This is a field. Is a field, the field of rational numbers. It is a commutative ring with unity. The number one is, well, it's one over one. It's also two over two. It's also three over three, etc. It's also negative one over negative one. That is the multiplicative identity. <clears throat> and every non-zero element does have an inverse, a multiplicative inverse. So every non-zero element is a unit. R is a field. Collection of real numbers under ordinary real number addition and real number multiplication. Um, proving this is a field. If you really want to be technical about it, is super super difficult actually. Because what's super super difficult about it <clears throat> is you have to first define what a real number is, and that's the extra hard part. Now you learn that real numbers. Well, one way to think of them is they're just all the rationals plus all the irrationals, union. If you're thinking in terms of decimals, the rational numbers, right, are either truncated decimals or repeated patterns in their decimal expansion. And the irrationals are all the ones that don't have a repeating pattern. And so the real numbers are all the possible decimals you can make. But if you think about that as a definition, it's really kind of problematic. Especially when you try to think about like, well, for one thing, because infinite decimals expansions, there's really a limiting process going on there. For example, when you write 0.3 repeating, which you all know is one third, what you really mean by that is you really mean um, three tenths plus three one hundredths plus three one thousandths, plus three ten thousandths, et cetera. It's really an infinite series, which means it's calculus, it's limits. <clears throat> you have to define what it means for that to converge and you got to know that it does converge, which has its problems as well, because like, well, how do you prove it converges if you don't know really know what a real number is in the first place? It's kind of like going around in circles. There are lots of subtle, subtle issues here. And you have a class next fall called Real Analysis where you kind of talk about these things in more depth. But even there, you really don't go in enough depth to truly prove them. You essentially take an axiomatic approach and you just assume the real numbers satisfy certain properties in that class. And you, in particular, you assume they form a field. You don't prove that they form a field in Real Analysis, you assume it. Truly proving it based on simpler things like just what are integers and what are rational numbers is really, really hard, actually. Because you got to define only based on integers and rational numbers and logic what a real number is. Could be a subject for a senior seminar paper. Particularly, I'm thinking of something called Dedekin cuts. You have no idea what that is. Dedekin cuts is one method of constructing the real numbers from the rational numbers. I don't claim that it's easy, but it's if you feel like looking it up or finding a video about Dedekin cuts, maybe you can find a good one that might give you a little insight there. It's K I. And be there. That it can. We will, as in real analysis, just accept R as a field without proof. It does take a lot of proof, though. However, once you prove R as a field, proving the complex numbers from a field is actually fairly easy once you know R as a field. 
as a set. This is the set of all complex numbers A plus BI, where A and B are real numbers, not just integers. So this is not the same as the Gaussian integers that we looked at 20 minutes ago. Essentially, the key issue for proving this as a field is showing that every non-zero element has a multiplicative inverse. In other words, what's one over A plus BI when this is a non-zero number? And it's a must doing a little trick. You, you figure it out by multiplying the top and the bottom by what's called the complex conjugate of A plus BI, A minus BI. Why? Because when you foil out the bottom here, watch what happens. It's beautiful. A times A is A squared. Outside times outside is minus ABI. Inside times inside is plus ABI. And last times last is minus B squared I squared. Those two things involving I cancel. The I squared becomes a negative one. So negative b squared times i squared is really plus b squared. The top still has an i, but you can't avoid that. This simplifies to a minus bi over a squared plus b squared, or if you prefer, a over a squared plus b squared minus b over a squared plus b squared times i. And if a plus b is a non-zero number, meaning either A is non-zero or B is non-zero or both are non-zero, A squared plus B squared will be positive. So we're not dividing by zero here. Positive. If either A is non-zero or B is non-zero or both are non-zero. How many fields are there? As you might guess, there's infinitely many. This does not exhaust the possibilities. If I changed in this example here, the A and B and allowed them to be rational numbers or real numbers. Well, it's more interesting with rational numbers. If I allowed A and B to be rational numbers rather than just integers, this actually forms a field if I allow A and B to be rational. The theorem that says any finite integral domain is a field. So ZP when P is prime is a field. Do you notice do you be able to prove these things? These are fairly short proofs. You should know these proofs. Do know, notice that in this proof, <clears throat> Euclid's lemma from chapter zero is required. This is where you use the fact that P is prime. Euclid's lemma said if P a prime divides A times B, then it either divides A or it divides B. That's handy here. Okay. Again, this stuff takes getting used to. So you got to work at it. See you on Wednesday.